Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome everybody here to our service. I'm running a little behind. I apologize for that uh, this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful Sunday morning, I think. Uh, I like a little bit cooler temperatures. I it was in the 50s. And uh, so it is a beautiful morning out there. A great day to be here. Any day, every day that we're here is a wonderful day. Uh, things we need to be aware of this this morning. Uh, you know, uh, Hawks uh, had hip replacement surgery and uh, Wednesday. And that went well, and she's she's back home. But keep uh, keep that Gale in your in your prayers. Uh, and uh, Kevin uh, Kevin Cameron, he uh, had been in the hospital up in Springfield. Uh, uh, and uh, had passed out at a gun show up there, and uh, he had had scheduled carotid artery surgery or procedure, and uh, at the heart hospital in Little Rock. Well, they went ahead and did that because he had over ninety percent blockage on one side, and so uh, that was the reason for him to pass out up there. So they did that. They also went in the next day and did some additional work on the uh, LAD uh, artery and uh, in, uh, trying to uh, open it up uh, more. And uh, so they did those two procedures this week. Also, while he was there, they uh, uh, discovered a, uh, uh, an issue with his lungs. They did an, a, a biopsy and it has come back as, uh, as cancerous. Uh, so please, Keep Kevin in your prayers. Uh, you know, it's a lot to digest. So, you know, just the physical parts of it, but also trying to keep your wits about you and, as you face those types of troubles. So please keep uh, keep Kevin in your in your prayers. Uh, <clears throat> Also, uh, I want to announce announcement. Uh, I asked to announce this, and we'll announce it on uh, April the 29th. The Havana EH Club here, uh, they are sponsoring a, uh, a suicide, and I believe this is a young person suicide prevention uh, seminar or uh, presentation, and they've got two speakers. Uh, that this is going to be over across the street at the Capitorium, Western Hill County High School Capitorium. And I'm sorry, I don't, I couldn't pull it up on my phone. It's either six or six thirty next week, uh, the 28th. Before it, uh, I'll have the actual time. I can't have, but it's one of those two times. And again, that's on April the 29th at the High School Capitorium. Uh, they have a. Uh, a uh, speaker uh, that's from this area who works for, uh, I believe, the uh, Department of Health uh, that's going to be speaking on that subject. They also have a family that has had to face that in, the, in their lives, and they're going to be here and, and talk about that too. So please be aware of that. And uh, that again, it's on Monday, the April the 29th. Uh, have our visitors we want to welcome you we always love to have company and uh, if you would like please fill out one of the visitors cards and put it in the plate or, or, or leave it in the pew we'll, we'll get it and uh, we're glad to have you here with us this morning uh, I see birthdays uh, Lindsay has a birthday on uh, the 27th and uh, so happy birthday, also anniversaries. Uh, you're 27. Okay. He's got it. Yeah, uh, and and uh, Brad and April, uh, uh, Mark, and, uh, also on the, on the 27th on our anniversaries. Uh, is there anything else that I've not mentioned, I've forgotten to mention uh, this morning? It, if not, we'll turn it over uh, to uh, Jared for our song service. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. 
everyone. I'm glad to see each and every one of you here. Our first song this morning will be number 453. Number 453. We'll sing all the verses of this. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me now saved. Yeah. 
to be able to assemble here this morning and worship to you. It is our prayer that our worship is found pleasing to you, that the songs that we sing can reach up to you and that they are found a, a sweet sound to you. As we just sang, we give thanks that we have this avenue of prayer and we can come to you to offer our thanks, to feel closer to you, to be able to bring our petitions to you. We are so thankful that we know that you hear our prayers, that you answer our prayers. We know that we always don't get it our way, but we know that because you hear our prayers, that we have assurance that you will do what is best. We ask a prayer for all of those this morning that were mentioned that are in need and physical needs and we pray for them, we pray for their recoveries, we pray that uh, they would once again be able to be here with us if be your will. We pray for all of those that are on our prayer list this morning, each and every one of them, whatever the need may be, that they too could be restored, if it be your will, to their good and wanted health, but that you would comfort and strengthen them and be with their families during these times, be with all of those that are seeing to the needs of each and every one of them. And we offer up a prayer this morning for our leaders, as you would want us and do want us to do. We pray for them that they would always look to you for their guidance. We pray that they would never try to do things and govern in such a way that would be contrary to your will. But that they would try to do your will as, and follow your will as they represent or lead us as a nation. We pray for those that protect us and protect our freedoms, both here in this country and, and abroad. We pray for all of the first responders. We pray for them that when they are in harm's way, and we pray for the families. We know we fail you in many ways. We stumble, we fall, we sin. We ask you, please forgive us Please give us the wisdom to understand your word, to come back to you in repentance, and to ask you for that forgiveness that is made available through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as your children. 
We pray for our young people. We pray that we can be the right type of example for them. That we would always be willing to be there for them when they need us. That they could look at us and see your Son, our Lord and Savior, in us through our actions. We pray all of this this morning in his name. Amen. As we come to remember our Lord's sacrifice and take upon the Lord's Supper, let us turn to number 350. Number 350. <coughs> We will sing all the verses to this. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I see, then I go to thee, garden of Gethsemane. There I walk amid the shades While the lingering twilight fades See that suffering friendless one Weeping, praying there alone When my love falls Man grows weak when for stronger faith I see. Hill of Calvary, I go to thy scenes of fear and woe. There behold his agony. So celebrate this Lord's Supper, I'd like to read from Matthew 26, beginning in the 26th verse. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broken, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then we read in Matthew about his betrayal and his crucifixion, his resurrection. We turn to Luke 24. 28th verse. After his resurrection, they drew near the village to where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, and he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, 
and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us this uh, memorial, this responsibility to remember your son's death. And remember that he was resurrected so Father, as we partake of this this morning, let us do so in a manner that would be worthy in your sight. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In like manner, Heavenly Father, bless this cup, the fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents the blood that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for our sins. If we partake of this, Heavenly Father, help us to realize that it was through this sacrifice that we all have the hope of an eternal life with you one day, that we partake of this in remembrance of him in a worthy manner. And these things we ask in Christ's name.
depart from the Lord's Supper when they have the opportunity to give back to God what he's prospered. Let's pray. Our only God and our Father in heaven, we come to you in prayer this morning to thank you for all the material blessings that you bless us with each and every day. As we now have the opportunity to give back a portion that you blessed us with, make one of us examine our hearts that we give freely with a cheerful heart. In these names we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Mark your song books to number 902. 902. And then the song before the lesson this morning will be number 548. 548. If you don't mind, if you please stand for this song. Sing the first and last verse. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. The fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see all I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my say. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily. The fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. Oh, all the power about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his man, my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory. scripture reading this morning, if you would like to read along, please turn to Matthew, the 15th chapter and verse 8. Again, that's Matthew 15 and verse 8. <clears throat> These people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Thank you, Daryl. <clears throat> morning, Daryl One. Good to see you here this morning. Daryl read the scripture from Matthew 15 and 8. where the people draw nigh to him with their mouth and honor him with their lips but their heart is far from him. 
honoring Christ. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of our honor. But how do we honor him? Jesus said, the Pharisees honored God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. Jesus Christ is certainly worthy of great honor. He is the creator of the universe, the only begotten Son of God, and the Bible declares him to be the king over all kings and Lord of over all. You know, we honor men of great stature, men who are given great authority and men who accomplish great things. But the one true deserving of honor is the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture says in Romans 14 and 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Imagine that sight. One day, every knee is going to bow before you. Now let us look at the passage in John 5. The Jewish leaders already had a very strong hatred for Christ. And his encounter between him and Jesus is recorded. Beginning in verse 8 of John 5. If you would, please turn your Bibles to John 5, verses 18 through 23. We read this. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he said that, the, that God was his Father, making him equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever we for whatever for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than those that you may that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has commanded all judgment to his Son. He's committed all the judgment to his Son, and that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. First of all, now Jesus here, he's establishing three things. First of all, men should honor the Son as much as they honor the Father. Because Jesus claimed equality with God. Second, if a person refuses to honor Jesus as such, then he also refuses to honor the Father. Because Jesus is the only approach to the Father. If a person rejects the Son, he also rejects the Father. We read in John 14 and 6, Jesus said, it un, uh, said unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Thirdly, the way that a person honors God, the Father, is by honoring his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But how do you honor Jesus? 
Let's look at what the Bible teaches about how we honor Christ. So how do we honor a great person? There's lots of ways that we assign honor to noble and honorable individuals. We might speak a great, a great about uh, their writings, about them in history books. We might erect a grand mar uh, marble memorial that will last centuries and testify to the person's significance and document their achievements. Or we might establish a whole uh, a day, a holiday, and dedicate that day to a person's memory. Noting their contribution to society. But how do we honor the Lord Jesus? Do we do it by building monuments and more memorials? Do we honor him by perhaps taking a day of the year and setting aside that day to remember and think about him? Do we honor him by merely saying great things about him? Remember what the Jesus said that the scribes and Pharisees said about in Matthew 15 and 8 that Daryl just read. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You see, we not only honor Jesus by what he said, by what he we say, but we, but more importantly, what our hearts lead us to do. Jesus said, And why call me Lord, Lord, to do not the things which I say? Luke 6 and 46. So how do we truly honor the Lord Jesus Christ? If I believe that Jesus is who he claims to be, shouldn't I want to honor him? It not he worthy of all honor? Yes, he is. Certainly he is. And I believe that the Word of God shows us several ways in the way we should honor him. The Bible not only tells us that we are to honor Christ, but it tells us how to honor him. Thus, when we honor him, we honor God the Father. Number one, we bring great honor to the name of Jesus Christ and we make a good confession. Paul spoke of that confession in 1 Timothy 6 and uh, 6 through 12, 13. You can turn with me there if you'd like. In 1 Timothy 6, 12 through 13, Paul says, to Timothy. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold to eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of my of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. What is the good confession that Paul is saying to Timothy and that Jesus made before Pontius Pilate? You recall that when Jesus was tried and put to death, he spent all night being accused of questions. Most of the night, Jesus was pretty well silent. Occasionally, he would answer a question 
that was framed in a certain way, but presumably about daybreak, the high priest asked Jesus, why won't you answer? But we find out as we turn to Matthew 26, Verses 62 through 64. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is this? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath. By the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is, it is as you said. Jesus is stating the truth of all ages and those in those few words. He was taking the whole of humanity, of human history, from the dawn of creation to the end of time on earth. And he was summing it up in one great declaration. That he was the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Paul later calls that the good confession. Today, we give great honor to Jesus Christ when we openly and unashamed make that good confession to an unbelieving world that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So think about what that, what that means. To tell someone that Jesus is the Christ, when we make that confession, we're not saying that Jesus is merely a good man or a gifted teacher or a powerful prophet. In making that confession, we're saying that Jesus is the only way to God and to eternal life. Now, there are many people who will confess that Jesus was a wonderful man. They will confess that he lived and that he said some important things and taught some wonderful lessons. They will agree that he they will agree that he went around doing some good things and good deeds. But that's not the same as confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. When one made that confession during the first century, he was putting his own life at risk. But those words, because those words had and still have today incredible implications. Consider this pivotal moment between Jesus and his disciples. In Matthew 16, 13 through 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his, his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, am I? And one of the pro or one of the prophets, he said unto them, But whom say, but whom say he that I am? And Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter never made a more profound statement. That was a confession that Peter would one day die for. And who, and so many others. 
Now the scriptures teach that anybody who would truly believe in Jesus and follow him and be saved must take this, that same great confession. You see, we give great honor, great honor to Jesus when we are willing to, to make and understand and understand what we are saying and consenting to the truth that is respect, that is represented. Christ said in Matthew 10, 32 through 33, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Have you ever noticed the following verses? In Matthew 10, 34. Think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but, I, but a sword. In other words, Jesus in other words, confessing Jesus as the Christ, saying to an, unbelie uh, to an unbelieving and skeptical world that you believe Jesus is everything he claimed he did to be, is not going to make you the world's friend. It will have a polarizing effect. In fact, in fact, it will make you the world's enemy. I'm telling you today that if you say what you believe about Jesus to, their, to very many people, you're going to find out how unpopular it really is. Some people will tolerate just enough about Jesus, but they don't tolerate the fact that he is the Son of God. The only way to heaven, the giver and arbitrator to divine truth, the judge of the world. But friends, we cannot give any greater honor to Jesus with our lips, and we can, and we can utter a stronger condemnation of a sinful world than to say what Peter said. What Jesus himself said and what the Ethiopian nobleman said in Acts 8 and 37. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Have you honored Christ by making a good confession? That confession must be made before you're baptized into Christ and receive pardon from your sins. Let's read a little more about the salvation of the Ethiopian nobleman in Acts 8, 36 through 38. We read, And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder it me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. He was willing to make that great confession and thus surrender his life in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now on the other hand, on the other side of that, we dishonor Jesus when we are not willing to make that confession 
before others. We dishonor Christ when we are too ashamed to confess that he is who the Bible says he is. When we are too ashamed to speak to others about him and to speak about him before others. Jesus said that if we deny him before men, he will deny us before the Father. Matthew 10, 33. Are you willing to honor Jesus by making a good confession before others? Are you ashamed or embarrassed by him and what he represents and teaches? I want to remind you that all of us will one day be made to confess Jesus Christ's name on that final day. There will be no doubt, no room for question or doubt. And even the most hardened unbelief, let's think of it, will tremble and bow before him on a bended knee, with stammering lips, confessing that he is the Christ. We also honor Christ by water baptism. You know, I'm, I'm always amazed the resistance of some people who can't claim to believe in Jesus, but they deny the plan of the simple teachings of Jesus about baptism. Think about it. There are millions and millions of people who claim God is Christ. But they deny what he said about baptism. Now they may not deny the act of baptism necessarily. While they may even practice baptism. But they deny what Jesus said about the role of baptism. Even though what Jesus said about it really could not be more clear and simple. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, and 16, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And in, my, and in John 3 and 5, Jesus said, Except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Let's notice that Jesus placed baptism outside, not inside, the door of the kingdom. Jesus showed the importance by being baptized himself at the very outset of his ministry. He did so to fulfill the right to fulfill all righteousness in Matthew 3, 14 through 15. And he later commanded all men, including you and me, to be baptized. And he made it a wonderful participation in his own death, burial, and resurrection. Paul said in Romans 6, 3 and 4, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized, all, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are bar were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. He didn't say that we were baptized because we were already in Christ. 
He said we were baptized into Jesus Christ. How? By being baptized into his death. So I imitate and thus participate in three great events in history when I submit in baptism. Now why do you think people reject that? Why do you why do they argue with and diminish and dilute that? The sacred transaction is just that. It is merely some, it is not merely some church ordinance that you can take or leave. It is a sacred transaction and a tremendous act of faith in the honor toward the Lord Jesus Christ. We, thirdly, we honor Christ by wearing his name the name Christian. That name first appeared in Acts 11, 26. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Christian simply means followers of Christ. It's a wonderful and worthy name. And it's a spiritual name. There are not a lot of names today that, first of all, you don't read about in the Bible. And second, they don't bring honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the name. Think about the name that you and your church wear. When someone asks you, what are you? What do you believe? What do you tell them? With all due respect, you don't read about Methodist or Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Baptist or Pentecostal, Lutheran, Catholics in the Word of God. What do, what you do read is that the church was built by Christ. Christ said to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It wasn't built by Martin Luther, John Wesley, John Calvin, John Smith, Alexander Campbell, or anybody else. It belongs to Christ. It was purchased by his own blood. Scripture says in Acts 20, 28, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. It doesn't belong to the Pope or some kind of council, or president, or superintendent. You know, you also read that it is called by his name. In Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. You see, we honor the Lord Jesus when we wear his name. The church is not a denomination. There is no room for denominating in the church, and you don't read about it in the New Testament. It is simply his church. The Apostle Paul used a beautiful Beautiful metaphor in Ephesians 5, 23 through 27. If you would please turn to 
next day. We read here that he says, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and that he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, let, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So when Paul tells us that the church is his bride, just as the bride honors her husband in taking him his name as her own. The Christian and the church in which he is part of, of is part, cannot honor Christ in any greater way than to wear his precious holy name. Fourthly, fourthly we honor Christ by partaking of the Lord's Supper. You know, I mentioned earlier that one of the ways we honor great men and historic, uh, and historic deeds is by building monuments and memorials to them. Those monuments stand as a testimony to the accomplishments and significance of that great person. Now the Lord never told us to build a statue for him or to erect some kind of monument to him or even display a cross for others to see as a memorial to him. In fact, Jesus built his own memorial before he was crucified. On the eve of his death, he gathered his small band of disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem and with these simple things he established a lasting memorial that remains to this day. There is nothing grand or elaborate by the world's standards about this memorial. It is a simple act involving these simple things that Jesus said would stand as a memorial to him as long as time would last. And 2,000 years after he did that, disciples still gather every Sunday, every first day of the week, the Lord's Day, to do exactly what Jesus did that night. In the same way that Jesus did. According to Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22, and 1 Corinthians 11, Jesus took the loaf of unleavened bread. He gave thanks for it and he shared it with his disciples, saying that it was to them to be his body. They were to eat in remembrance of him. He then took the cup of the fruit of the vine and he blessed it. He drank out of it and behold and, and handed it to his disciples and they were to drink from it. Reflecting together upon the new covenant and his precious blood and sealed that new covenant. They <coughs> They were to come together and thus remember his death until one day when he comes again. Now friends, when a congregation of the Lord's, of God's people come together and share the bread and the cup of the little we're honoring the Lord Jesus, just as we observed this morning. 
The Bible tells us that the early church did that upon the first day of the week. And in Acts 8, 20 through 7, the scripture says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. We are told that they did it steadfastly and often. Acts 2, 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and followed and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do so, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. But have you stopped to realize that the multitudes of churches will get on the Lord's day and not even observe the Lord's Supper. Friends, the Lord's day is a very special day. Every Lord's day is a special day. It is the, it is the day upon which the church was taught by example, to come together and honor Christ and his sacrifice in sharing his son. <coughs> and the early church did that every Sunday for at least two centuries after Jesus established it. Fifthly, we honor Christ by following his teaching. We follow his pattern and obey him by doing things in the way that he wanted them done. We honor Christ. I just told you about the Lord's Supper. The apostles called it the Lord's Supper. And there's a great implication in that. It's not your suffering or my suffering. But it's his son. Jesus said that we are to do what he did as we partake of it. Think about it this way. What if you were to prepare a meal for me and graciously invited me to your home to share in that meal? Suppose I came to your home and sat down at your table and I began to be crucial and critical and to rearrange the table and do what and at the table and that you had set. What if I were to say, is this all? Shouldn't you have had something more, something different? Or what if I said, I don't like the way you set your table. I don't like the dishes that you give. Surely you don't expect me to eat or drink from that. I suspect you would feel very insulted not on. Now I want to tell you something. I have been in many homes in my youth when my daddy was the preacher of the gospel in Gravely, Arkansas at the Church of Christ there back in the 70s. Our family would be invited to different homes each Sunday of each member. And I remember eating meals at that table set by those people. Some were wealthy and many on the other hand who were relatively poor. And 
we had been invited into their homes and eaten from fine china. And I ate meals from paper plates in their homes. Whereas that was about all that they had. You know, I'd never think of telling someone that I don't like the way they set the table. Or what it wasn't that it wasn't good enough. Or that I wanted to be a better meal. I'd never dishonor our host in that way. Jesus, by his grace and mercy, has invited us to sit at his table. There is nothing fancy or elaborate about it. In fact, judging by many people's response today, had they been invited to Jesus' supper in the upper room long ago, they might shy away and react with disgust or disgrace. But oh, it's so precious, a precious gift to be invited to the lowly supper of the lowly king. And you honor him when we follow his example in that and every other act of worship of the Christian service. We honor him when we follow his instructions in submission and simply do what the Bible says. Sixth and final thing to cover. We honor Christ by imitating his life. That really is one of the greatest honors that we can pay to another person. To model ourselves after them. Jesus came and lived among us for that purpose. Scripture says, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. 1 Peter 2, 21. His daily life, his compassion, his compassionate deeds, his wonderful words, his pure and holy living, his faithfulness to God, and all those things are worth imitating. And in John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. So my question this morning to you, are you honoring Jesus by your daily life? That you live? Are you striving to live a clean and pure and holy life that honors Christ Jesus? By your words and your deeds. If you haven't. And if you haven't obeyed God, the gospel. The Lord. And making that good confession. And being baptized. For the remission of your sins. I hope you'll do that this morning. And honor the Lord Jesus with your life. That he gives you. If you have any need this morning to respond to the gospel of Christ, you could do so this morning. Stand and sing. What can wash away my sin? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood.
Our closing song this morning will be number 711. Number 711. After this, we'll have our closing prayer. We'll sing the first and last verse. Bind us together. Blessed be tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The